Hi. Uh, today I wanted to go over some research I've been delving into about what works for the coronavirus, COVID-19 possibly, because it's all still um, in the research stage, and what might be contraindicated for the virus. And for me, delving into these things gives me peace because I want to be able to take action um, for my health, for myself, and for my family. So I really like to be armed with as much information as possible. And I wanted to share this with you all because there's actually some really interesting um, updates and, and really truly things that look like they're going to work. They do work. There's reasons why they could work and studies going on about, about that. And then the things that are contraindicated are really valuable. So let's get right to it. I made a document. Um, I'm going to show you my screen. Okay, now i got to get my little guy up here. Um, all right. So... The first thing I want to talk about is ibuprofen. So I don't know if you've heard about this yet, but there's a lot of talk going on about how Advil is contraindicated as well as cortisone for the coronavirus, for COVID-19. And according to the French government, that it could have grave adverse effects are linked to the use of non-steroid anti non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They urge that the treatment of a fever or a pain linked to COVID-19 uh, should be paracetamol. That's the European version of Tylenol or uh, acetaminophen. So according to the French health minister, he also worked as a neurologist. He said that taking anti-inflammatory inflammatory drugs could be an aggravating factor of the infection. And again, saying that take paracetamol if you are, um, if you're already on anti-inflammatory drugs, ask your doctor for advice. So I also want to put just a little caveat on here that if I do understand that there's a certain amount of pain associated with COVID-19, that's one of the symptoms of it. And I understand that um, you might want to take something for that. So I understand if you're really uncomfortable, you can take this Tylenol at the beginning. Uh, you definitely don't want to take Advil right now until more research is done, but I'm also going to tie this into some other stuff that we're going to talk about. And it does indicate that Advil should not be used. Um, but again, if you have a fever, you don't want to just bring down your fever. Remember your body's way of fighting off an infection is to give you a fever. So there's no reason to lower it unless you're really extremely uncomfortable. So in pain or just so it's so high that you have to lower it. Um, otherwise, let your body do its work and heat up the system and fight off the virus. All right. So the next thing to avoid, and again, this is going to tie into what you should take, are ACE inhibitors. They are prescription drugs usually used for hypertension or diabetes, all right? And there's a study right now in the Lancet, I'm going to pull it up, that they're beginning, and the hypothesis is that the treatment of diabetes and hypertension with ACE2 stimulating drugs increases the risk of developing severe and fatal COVID-19. Let me go to that study and show you why, because it does explain how this action could work, and it makes a lot of sense. Again, this is still a study, so it hasn't been proven, but once you start to look at the reason, the rationale behind it, it makes a lot of sense. So what these ACE inhibitors do, so wait, let me start right here, okay? Human coronaviruses, okay, SARS and SARS-CoV-2, bind to their target through this converting enzyme ACE2, all right? Now, the expression of ACE2 is substantially increased in patients with type 1 or 2 diabetes. They are treated with ACE inhibitors or the ARBs. Hypertension is also treated with ACE inhibitors and ARBs, 
which results in the upregulation of ACE2. So what you're actually doing by taking these drugs the, is you're increasing your body's receptiveness to getting this specific virus, the coronavirus. You're opening the pathway. This drug is opening the pathway, increasing the receptors to getting uh, the coronavirus. And what's really interesting, excuse me, <coughs> as I cough, um, what's really interesting is if you look at this graph, this will be very enlightening if I can get this graph up for you. Okay. These are the comorbidities for the coronavirus. Now, often there's two or three of these that a patient will have if they do die of the coronavirus, of COVID-19. And look, hypertension is the number one comorbidity. Then diabetes. Both of these use ACE2 inhibitors or ARBs. Next is, is heart disease. You, can, you also may be prescribed that, those drugs for that. Atrial fibrillation, again, you may also be prescribed these drugs that are contraindicated according to this potential. Again, this is still just in the studying phase. And renal failure. So kidney, you, you could easily be uh, prescribed these for any kidney problems you might be having. So that's one, two, three, four, five, the top five, literally the top five. May the, these patients may also be prescribed this prescription drug. That to me is a huge red flag, and it's already being studied as being problematic. It logically makes sense that it's problematic. Um, so I sorry I'm going all over the page here, but I really think anyone on these drugs, if your parents are on these drugs, if someone you know is on these drugs. It's definitely worth talking to the doctor about switching the type of drug that they're on to avoid having literally kind of opening the door. It's as if you're opening the door for the coronavirus. You're making more doors for the coronavirus to come in. So that's not a good thing. Um, all right. And then to get to the good news, because the good news is is interesting and good news. And I'm going to, this is a paper uh, that I was writing up um, about things that are positive. But I'm gonna skip ahead to my quercetin um, because now the exciting update that we've all heard about, President Trump has talked about it, so there's no mystery here. And other countries have already been using it and experimenting with it, is the hydroxychloroquine and also chloroquine the hydroxychloroquine is a little more effective than the chloroquine. Um, but now the same action as chloroquine that can be, can be achieved, it's the same concept. I'm not saying it's the same effectiveness, but it's the same concept with quercetin. And this is a natural supplement. And I recommend taking it with zinc. I'm going to play you a video uh, with, of a doctor that explains the action of it. Because what you're doing with this, and it actually has to do, again, with these ACE inhibitors. But this is actually opening up. It's, it's using so zinc, as we know, is, is effective against uh, viruses and against influenza and the coronavirus. There's a certain amount of efficacy. The problem with zinc is it's hard to get into your st cell itself to stop the virus from replicating. It's hard to get zinc into the cells, not easily uh, taken into the cell. So quercetin becomes a carrier molecule for that. It helps the zinc get in. So as long you don't want to be deficient in zinc. You don't want to have too much zinc either, so it would be much better if you could take a blood test and see how much zinc you have. But most of us are zinc deficient. So I would recommend taking this with zinc, having the quercetin help the zinc get into the cell. And what this does is it's blocking the virus from entering the cell. This is effective for Ebola. They did use a lot. They used three to seven grams or 3,000 to 7,000 micrograms a day. So I'm going to let Medcram, and if anyone hasn't been watching his videos, I highly recommend them. Okay, so here it is. Let me play it.
if the mechanism of action for hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine in vitro in stopping the virus is related at all to the fact that it's also a zinc ionophore, then the question is obvious. Do other zinc ionophores do the same thing? And here's the zinc ionophore quercetin. Does quercetin also do the same thing in terms of increasing zinc intracellularly and blocking viral production? Well, here we have some data that was published, and we'll put a link to this article in the description below. And you can see here clearly that when you add zinc in an increasing concentration, zinc does get inside the cell. But when you add quercetin, it's going to increase the amount of zinc inside the cell. So the next question is, does it actually reduce virus? Well, again, an in vitro study, quercetin, as an antiviral agent, inhibits influenza A virus entry. This study indicates that quercetin, showing inhibitory activity in the early stage of influenza infection, provides a future therapeutic option to develop effective, safe, and affordable natural products for the treatment and prophylaxis of influenza infections. This is not COVID-19. This is influenza. And here we can see that at zero quercetin, we see a lot of viral particles here that are illuminated with the fluorescent antibodies. And as we increase the dose of quercetin, you can see that the number of particles decreases rapidly until it's not seen at all. As we can see here, there is some evidence that quercetin had already been proven successful at treating Ebola and Zika viruses. The question is, what's going on with COVID-19? And here we have a story from CBC, which is the news organization of Canada, spread speeds up. Montreal researchers will trial an antiviral treatment for COVID-19 in China. These two researchers here out of Montreal are wanting to test quercetin in the arena of COVID-19. Now, this drug is derived from plants, and you don't need a prescription for it, and you can actually get this over the counter. Now, in the number of studies that I've seen and researched on the internet, this medication was tested in Zika and Ebola viruses at a dose of around 50 to 100 milligrams per kilogram, which would mean that you're talking about three to seven grams a day of this medication, which is just astounding. I don't know if that's the dose that is actually needed, but that's what the studies were showing. Let's summarize what we found out here for... Okay, so there you have MedCram's very good explanation about how quercetin can work. And we're going to... So I just wanted to have him explain it because he does such a great job um, talking about why quercetin can be used. And what you can do is you can use it prophylactically. So we're taking that now. I'm not on three, I'm on 3,000 a day. Take it three times a day with the zinc, a little bit of zinc. So maybe I should go up a little bit, but that's where I'm starting. And I know some other um, doctors like this, this, I'm going to show you this real quick right here. Um, and he also details some studies just because I like to be clear that this is being studied and this is truly scientific. This is not just, you know, oh, take this supplement and it might work. So there we, here we go. What this, this is really interesting is they used a supercomputer to model, look at this, to model which FDA approved compounds might interfere with the coronavirus binding to cells. To review the coronavirus you, to review, the coronavirus uses the ACE2 receptor to enter cells. Once in a cell, the coronavirus empties its RNA, hijacks the cell to produ produce more viruses. So again, this is speaking to what you don't want to take, which is the those drugs that are ACE2 inhibitors, which become upregulators. Um, Anyway, so preventing the coronavirus from binding to the ACE2 receptor is a good thing as it means the virus can't get into your cells. The study modeled various compounds and clocking in at number five was quercetin. So that was like a match, a computer match to this. Oh, shoot. Um, all right, hold on. And then here is 
first realize that the novel coronavirus is a family of coronavirus that include everything from SARS. Um, as a result, quercetin has been tested against other viruses in this family. For example, a 2004 lab study showed that it blocked the entry of another SARS coronavirus. And a 2012 study basically concluded the same thing. And he annotates these at the bottom. So again, this makes logical sense that it's going to work in the same way for this specific coronavirus. And he goes on to detailing this. And then he also mentions the Montreal uh, scientist and how they're studying quercetin. He received a $1 million donation. All right, there you go. And then again, the same doctor is explaining why these blood pressure medications are not good for you. Um, here we go. One of the problems recently brought up by experts is that some of the most common blood pressure medications on the market uh, make more of this a ACE2 receptor upregulation. So all of these things are connected logically. We're finding out that the comorbidities are super high with people that have hypertension, diabetes, heart trouble already. How many of them are on these ACE2 inhibitors, which we now are realizing are opening the door for the virus? This is very serious and needs to be truly studied quickly. Um, here's a list of the ACE2 inhibitors in case anyone in your family, you want to check this out, um, and the ARBs. Just want to let you see that real quick. Okay, so now he's saying just in terms of dosing for the quercetin, the usual dose is 500 to 1,000 a day. He has his family just on that dose. Again, I'm so I'm I'm in between this person's dosing recommendation and med crams from the from uh, the past study that he was referencing. But I think it's really an interesting supplement, quercetin. That it's also been studied for cancer, and it's a very powerful um, plant-based supplement. So do your own research. There is a little bit of shortages happening already online. Um, and I think this is a way to get around taking the malaria drug. You can't get it anyway. Um, they have tried to save those for people that are really going to need it. And I know a lot of the hospitals and individual doctors have bought a certain amount. But it is for people that are sick at this point. So you're, it's going to be difficult, at this point at least, to get that to take it prophylactically. But this you can take and it's over the counter and it's a regular supplement. So this sort of stuff gives me hope and I like to take it because I feel like I'm doing something, I'm being proactive, I'm fighting it, and I have tools to help my family fight it. I hope this was helpful.